Hello, everyone, and welcome <clears throat> once again to Addressing the COVID-19 Crisis, our open forum webinar series for pharmacists. This is July the 16th, and we are very delighted to have you with us. I'm Michael Hogue, the Dean of the School of Pharmacy at Loma Linda University and the President of the American Pharmacists Association, and I'm pleased to be your moderator this week. We are very excited about the program we have for you today. We're going to be discussing social determinants of health and how the social determinants of health can impact the effectiveness of patients' clinical care and how pharmacists can address uh, health inequities that exist in our communities. And frankly, I think we all recognize and realize based upon data and, and information that we've seen uh, that um, uh, COVID-19, this crisis that we're in, this pandemic has really exacerbated um, and, and demonstrated to us the severity of, uh, of the impact of social determinants on health outcomes. And so pharmacists and communities across the country have a great opportunity to address the social determinants. Well, we have uh, perhaps two of the brightest minds in pharmacy that will be telling us all about this today and helping us to think through all of the aspects. We're pleased today to have as our guests, uh, first of all, Dr. Leanne Ross. Uh, Dr. Ross is Associate Dean of Clinical Affairs and Professor of Pharmacy Practice at the University of Mississippi School of Pharmacy. She's also the President-Elect of the American College of Clinical Pharmacy, and we're delighted to hear from her. She has a, a wide range of experiences um, at Ole Miss in working with the State Department of Health, County Health Departments, and community pharmacies to help uh, address social determinants of health and has is well published in this area as well. So we're very delighted to have uh, Leanne with us. We're also delighted to be joined by Dr. Pilar Murphy. Uh, Dr. Murphy is a clinical associate professor of pharmacy practice at Samford University's McWhorter School of Pharmacy in Birmingham, and she practices pharmacy at the Marion Rural Health Clinic in conjunction with an organization called Sowing Seeds of Hope uh, and the Marion uh, Department of Public Health. She is located in one of Alabama's most rural counties and is providing healthcare services in a county where uh, the uh, stroke rate is among the highest in the nation and the COVID infection rate is the highest per capita in the state of Alabama. So uh, Dr. Murphy, we're glad to have you with us as well. Now this week, like all weeks, we have some experts from APHA staff that will also be joining us. Mitch Rothholz, APHA's Chief Strategy Officer, is, as many of you know, an expert in uh, vaccines and uh, works very closely with the policy making bodies uh, nationwide as it relates to vaccine related topics. He'll be answering any questions you have today about vaccines. We're also joined by APHA staff members in government affairs, Michael Baxter, who's Senior Director of Regulatory Policy for APHA, and Alicia Carey Micah, who is uh, a senior lobbyist for APHA. And as we get to the end of the program today, we need to share some really important information with you about some action that Congress is about to take, and we need your help with that. And so we're really hoping that you'll hang with us to the end of the program, because we need to be able to talk with you about that today. Now, we uh, will be taking your questions on any subject related to COVID-19. So uh, you'll notice in uh, your GoToWebinar control panel that there's a question box. And we would just encourage you that as questions come to mind throughout the webinar, or even now, uh, you can go ahead and type in those questions. We'd encourage you to go ahead and do that and get yourself in the queue. Uh, what we would like to be able to do is if you have audio capability, meaning that you've connected via your computer, uh, we will unmute your line and allow you to ask your question verbally. Now, if you'd prefer not to do that and you would prefer to have me ask the question, just type in as a part of your question, no audio available, and that'll give me the cue that I need to ask your question for you. For those of you who may be connected on a cell phone today and you would like to ask your question, we would ask that you please go ahead now 
and um, enter in the audio pin that's provided to you by GoToWebinars so that when it's time to unmute your line, your line will be unmuted and we'll be able to hear you. You'll also notice on the control panel that there's a handout tab and the handout for today's program is included and there are quite a number of links for your future reference so I'd encourage you to take time to download the handout but if for some reason you forget don't worry we're recording today's webinar and we'll make the content available to you within 24 hours on pharmacist.com in the COVID-19 resources section so you have that coming to you uh, either way and so um, I think we've covered just about everything today uh, in terms of getting uh, getting you set for the webinar so what I'd like to do uh, is, uh, is invite uh, Dr. Ross and Dr. Murray Murphy to join me on webcam uh, so that our audience can see you and we're going to begin the conversation today. Dr. Ross, Dr. Murphy, welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to have you both here. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ross, we're going to start with you. Could you please um, uh, just share with us uh, what are the social determinants of health? And we hear so much about this today. It seems like there's conversation about this, even in the news media, about social determinants of health. Help us understand what are the social determinants of health so that we're all on the same page. Well, uh, thank you, Michael. And thank you again for um, inviting me to participate in this panel uh, today. I'm honored to be a part of it and excited to join my colleague and neighbor, Dr. Murphy from Alabama, and sharing our experiences. Um, we have a, a little different view um, in, in the experience we have with the disproportionate impact uh, in the minority communities in our state. So we're, I'm glad to have an opportunity to share. Um, to your question, uh, which I hope will provide foundation for our discussion today, uh, social determinants of health are conditions in the environments in which people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that can affect a wide range of health, their functioning and quality of life outcomes and risks. These conditions can be social, economic, or physical in the various environments or settings, such as school, church, workplace, neighborhood, and have often been referred to as place. In addition to the more material attributes of place, the patterns of social engagement, the sense of security and well-being are also affected by where people live. Healthy People 2020, which you see depicted there on the slide, developed a place-based framework that reflects five key areas of social determinants of health. These are economic stability that you see, education, social and community context, health and health care, which can be access to care, access to primary care, health literacy, neighborhood and built environment where you may see environmental conditions, housing conditions, access to healthy foods. And from this frame framework, a set of objectives have been developed and an initial set of evidence-based resources and examples have been provided and, and provide guidance on how this social determinant approach may be implemented both at a state or a local level. The next slide takes and provides a bit more detail on what social determinants of health are. And you can see here um, that the first that 10% is the physical environment, um, something like environmental quality is reflected there. Um, and at 20%, you see there's health care and that's access to care, or quality of care. Um, in the top left of that um, pie, you see 30% being health behaviors tobacco use, diet, exercise, those types of health behaviors. And then coming in at 40% are socioeconomic factors like education, employment, income, family, and social support. So this kind of gives you an idea um, and a framework from which we can talk about social determinants of health. 
this is a really great foundation and helps us uh, to really visually see here what we're talking about. And, um, you know, Dr. Murphy, as a pharmacist working in the local community there in Perry County, Alabama, I wonder if you might uh, just talk to us a little bit about how you are working to address social determinants of health in, in your work. And as a pharmacist, just, just give us a little bit of insight to how pharmacists, in your view, can address these social determinants that we see here. Okay, so we do have a hypertension clinic. It's actually called the Cardiovascular Risk Reduction Clinic, and it's at the Perry County Health Department. It's in the center of town. But what we've also seen is we have to take into account transportation for people in the county because a lot of people don't have access simply because they don't have a car or they don't have um, public transportation. And so for us, we try to do different screenings out in the community. We try to go to local churches so that we can go where people are instead of always relying on them to come to where we are. We um, try to make sure that people know where they can find us, but also trying to do as much as we can when they are in the office, because for some people, um, they may come to town once a month and that's it. Well, I think you hit on something that's really important in that uh, sometimes addressing social determinants of health means that we have to go where people are located uh, and not expect that they may be able to come to where we're providing our normal clinical services. And that's a different thought or a different approach. Uh, Leanne, I wonder, uh, have you seen similar things in Mississippi with your community pharmacies that are working or your faculty that are working in uh, addressing social determinants of health? Are they also similarly having to take the service, so to speak, to, to the patient population in, in, in uh, un unusual or different settings than we, we typically see? Absolutely. Um, I think that's one of the benefits of um, the community pharmacy in particular. We are seeing, and we do quite a bit of work with federally qualified health centers, and um, we've had pharmacists integrated into sites with other um, physician practices and primary care providers and transportation is always an issue with our populations as well um, and getting them there for access to care and so looking at alternate ways that we can do things community pharmacies are more accessible for some of our patients and so um, that I think that can be um, an advantage and, and a, certainly a way we can work with patients both in the medication management aspect and on social determinants of health. Also looking, um, one of the things that we've had the opportunity to do in the last few years is, is really expand the work we're doing with telehealth. Um, and that has helped as in regard to um, giving access to certain patients who may not have the transportation capabilities, and et cetera, um, and, and provides that med management there as well. So, so last week we uh, did our webinar, our weekly update for pharmacists on COVID-19 on telehealth, or two weeks ago, I'm sorry, <laughs> time flies. Uh, and um, one of the things we recognized is that the definition of telehealth has really expanded because I would have assumed that uh, because of social determinants that actually access to the technology related to telehealth would be problematic for some populations. Um, Pilar, could you tell us, is that true? I mean, uh, in, in the rural areas, uh, do, do your patient population have access to uh, cell phone technology or video technology that they can engage in telehealth or how have you addressed that? I would say that our younger patients do. Everybody has a smartphone. And so you can reach them, you can do a face-to-face -face with them. It's our older population because even though they may have a cell phone, it's usually still like a little flip phone. Um, they are really not big on technology. And actually in some areas of the county, even though you may have a cell phone, it does not work out in different areas of the county. So you just cannot get type of cell reception. So it has been um, helpful for some who have the capability of being able to get on a network. But if you're out in more of, in a more rural area of the county, we're still trying to do the best we can. If you have a landline phone, we'll talk to you <laughs> like that. But the face-to-face -face has not been as easy for a lot of people in the community. 
So I think the point here is, is that when we say telehealth and addressing the social determinants of health, I think Leanne and Pilar, maybe you would agree that that could just be simply a telephone call and, and engaging in telephone conversation. It doesn't have to be a video uh, conversation. Is that right? Am I getting it right? That is absolutely correct. I mean, I have a patient who's 91. If I can just get her on the phone and just talk to her about, you know, what's going on. I mean, the mental aspect of having to stay at home, how you're doing with your meds, that phone call does a world of good and it does not have to be face to face. Absolutely. Now, I want, I, I'd like to shift just a little bit to talk about COVID-19. Leanne, uh, how do you feel that social determinants of health and the impact of, of social determinants have impacted COVID-19 testing? I mean, have you seen, you know, impacts that maybe we haven't thought about uh, related to these things we're seeing on the screen and as, as it uh, relates to COVID testing? Right, I think um, testing has been, um, a, different i think in different states and accessibility has been different in rural areas we um, have had fewer testing sites although i have to commend our state health department and our medical center and really standing up testing sites as quickly as they could but these still are not accessible to some of our most vulnerable populations and so access can be an issue um, and as we just discussed with clinic appointments and things um, patients may not have the transportation to the testing sites um, they may be distant from those. And so I think it's an opportunity, um, as we talked about community pharmacies being so accessible and incorporating more testing in community community pharmacies could help to alleviate this access issue in certain communities at least. Uh, there are um, some issues around that, I think, as well. I know in our state, um, while we have the ability to do testing in our community pharmacies, um, we are limited in our ability to get some of the supplies for testing right now. We're not, the pharmacies are not on the limited distribution list. And so um, continuing to work towards that, because I see that as an opportunity for um, pharmacies there. Um, and I think, um, too, there's some perception differences in different cultures regarding testing and mitigation strategies with COVID-19. There's a lot of misinformation and communication strategies may not always be ideal. So I feel like um, pharmacies and community pharmacists have a role to play there with regard to um, providing good information and helping patients as they navigate through testing. Even if they have access to it, some of them may not um, may need some assistance in, in really getting the information and directing them to the resources for testing. Yes. Pilar, I wonder if you could expound on that also just a little bit further. I mean, we've seen uh, clearly from the epidemiologic data uh, that, that African Americans and Native Americans in particular have been uh, hit disproportionately hard uh, with COVID-19, uh, both with infection rate and um, with uh, the, the death rate, the mortality rate is, is much higher in both communities. Um, can you speak a little bit to this, the, these issues and why you think this is the case and, and give us some of your thoughts on this? Well, I think part of it goes back to just having more chronic disease states in those um, populations. I mean, when you Perry County, we have um, in the county we have 67% of us are African American, and so you already are behind the gun because you have higher rates of hypertension, diabetes, MI, stroke, and so you already have the setup because you have mostly people who are in that, those vulnerable. Um, populations when we think of over the age of 65 and you have those different disease states. But I started thinking also about when you think about the physical environment, um, one person in the family might test positive. And if you have a, a nuclear family, if people are not being educated on what it really means to um, self-isolate when you go home, that doesn't just mean go home and just stay with your family because you can still go home and infect your family if you are not taking the proper precautions. And so I think part of it has to do with that as well. Um, I was talking to Mrs. Francis Ford, who is the healthcare coordinator for Perry County. And what we're seeing is our um, rate 
is going up a lot, but it's going up with the whole family. They'll come in and it's like everybody in the household has tested positive for COVID. And so a lot of it has to do with just not really understanding what it means to self-isolate. If I go home, I really need to stay away from my four-year-old. I don't need to be around my mom. I need to do as little as possible to be around them, even though I may have to be under the same roof as them. And I think that has a lot to do with it as well, but also the fact that we already have so many chronic conditions. Yeah, so I'm, I'm struck by the fact that there's two things. One is, is that pharmacists are getting more involved nationwide in doing uh, COVID testing when supplies are available uh, to do that. And that's a wonderful thing, but it's more than just the testing. It's the education that has to go with the testing. It sounds like you're saying, uh, Pilar, that's just as important. And, and then also, um, our country shut down for months and in fact in some states uh, including the one i'm in currently we're pretty shut down here in california right now and the access to care has declined markedly but people are still having strokes and people are still having heart attacks uh cancer still exists and these chronic conditions haven't gone away and the big question is who is it that's going to help individuals with those chronic underlying conditions take care of those conditions even though we have a pandemic and it seems like uh, in conversations we all had that's that's an important role for the pharmacist what what do you think about that uh, pilar i think it's really important to stay in contact with your patients being a community pharmacist most of the time we know our patients i have patients who come to my clinic at least two to three times a week i mean two to three times a month if I haven't heard from them, I've, I've kind of had to get out of the mindset of not wanting patients to have my cell phone um, number during this time. I did, I texted a patient yesterday just saying, I hadn't heard from you, how are you doing? How's your blood sugar running? Um, and so making sure that people don't forget and are so focused on COVID that they forget, they still have hypertension, they still have diabetes, they need to be doing that regular follow-up and really educating patients for me, it's telling patients, okay, this is what they're doing at your doctor's office to keep you safe. They're not allowing people to just sit in the waiting room. You check in outside, they let you sit in your car because people are frightened. And so making sure that they know they still can be taken care of at the primary care um, office, at, at the pharmacy, you can still get what you need. Our local pharmacy actually will deliver your meds. And so making sure that people know what's available and then educating them um, on making sure that they're staying current with those other disease states. Uh, Leanne, I wonder if you have any, any tips in terms of uh, what pharmacists can do to ensure, you know, right now it's tough times and your, your pharmacists are putting themselves in harm's way oftentimes by taking care of patients and keeping their pharmacies open. Have you seen some success stories, some things that are working in terms of community pharmacies and others who are, who are still engaging with their chronic disease uh, issues and patients? Right, I think, um, and Laura did a great job of, of describing some of the ways that, and I think those touch points are so important in staying in contact um, with the patients and answering their questions because they have so many, and when things are shut down, they have very few resources available to answer some of those questions. So I think that's um, a big piece of it. And a lot of the pharmacies in these alternate scenarios, um, we're doing home delivery or curbside services or, um, things in addition to this extended personal patient outreach that she described. And so some of that they learned about medical concerns and they're dealing with the medical concerns and helping them get the primary care they need or other things. But they're also learning about non-medical issues as well and seeing them address some of those. So certain pharmacies have developed partnerships um, with um, I know local farmers markets so that they have fresh produce available for the patients who are coming into their pharmacy during the pandemic. Um, others have partnered with community health workers um, and there's you know nationwide more of an, a, a push towards partnering there um, to try to work with the community health workers who may be going into the home and that type of thing and so some of these initiatives um, have provided some formality to pharmacy's role in addressing social determinants of health in this pandemic even.
know that this is a critically important topic for pharmacists. And so we've got a couple of slides, I think, that have some uh, uh, additional resources for pharmacists. Leanne, could you maybe cover a little bit of this and talk, talk to us about these resources? And folks, I'll just tell you up front, I realize that there's a lot of information on these slides. Remember, the handouts are available for your download and all of the links in the handouts uh, are active, so you can link directly to it. Leanne, tell us about these uh, tools. Great, I certainly will. Um, and, and these are, there is quite a bit of information here. Um, but as you look at this slide, one of the things that, um, we would encourage community pharmacists to do is really to look at um, ways that they can incorporate assessing social determinants of health. You're probably very familiar with a lot of the social determinants of health of the, of the patients who come into your pharmacy, but putting into place a more formal way of looking at that and collecting that data can help you as you are then implementing and tailoring your services to those patients and even sharing some of that data, hopefully in the future. But um, this on the right side of the screen that you see there is a checklist for adopting social determinants of health assessments. And it really walks you through what is needed uh, to implement that more formally, talking about who will capture the data at your site and how will that data be used. And so just thinking through some of those things and, and maybe a workflow as to how you might could get more information that could be helpful in that regard. And there are some uh, screening tools out there that really are specific to social determinants of health. And that you see many of those listed here and at the top and the left is the are some common screening tools that you see, the protocol for assessing patients Assets, assets, risk, and experiences there. The second one is through um, CMS, and it's the CMMI Accountable Health Communities of Health screening tool. The third one is with the AAFP, and fourth is Health Leads. But I would encourage you uh, to look through those, and, and while they may not be exactly what you would want, you could tailor those to your specific needs, um, but it would provide a, a way that you could um, collect some of that data and, and really looking at who on your team could be collecting that, at what point how you might document that, et cetera. But keeping in mind too, that some of these are asking questions outside of what we're normally used to, which is you know around um, medication use or health literacy. We've done quite a bit of work looking at that and use tools like that in pharmacies before. But these are asking some really tough questions about living environments and things like like that. And so just making sure if you go to implement these that you have the appropriate referral sources um, is an important aspect of it as well. And making community partnerships is a big part of this and really identifying who those um, community individuals or organizations are who have shared goals around these social determinants of health and establishing formal referral um, relationships there um, are very important as well. But you're, you're in a great position to do that. Um, yeah, that's that's absolutely right. We're uh, pharmacists are such uh, valuable resources in local communities, and it's uh, uh, it's uh, now more than ever been evident to our uh, our congressmen, our our uh, executive branches at the state and national levels that uh, pharmacists truly are, to use a pun, an indispensable resource in the local community. Uh, on the next slide, we do have several other additional resources available for. Uh, for pharmacists, including reference to that Healthy People 2020 uh, wheel that was shown at the beginning of the webinar and some other additional uh, resources <clears throat> that you can use with your patients and for your own educational background. Uh, so uh, we really would encourage you to, uh, uh, to use those. Uh, Leanne or Pilar, do uh, either of you have any comments about these resources that you'd like to make? I will say the one that was by the American Family Physicians, I did pull that one up. And like Leanne said, it asked some tough questions. Like one of the questions is like, um, do you live in an environment where you feel unsafe? And so if you are having to ask a patient those types of questions, I think it's really good for us to understand we have to first form relationships with patients before they may feel comfortable answering some of those questions but also being able to kind of pick up on those social social cues that let you know what's going on. Working out in the community, I know people who are unemployed and may be struggling with getting enough to eat. And so sometimes if we're having a food giveaway or something in town, we try to make sure that we call them and just tell them this is going on so they don't feel like they're being singled out 
but that the resources available. We have one of our listeners on today's uh, program who has a tool that uh, she likes to use. And uh, I wonder if we could unmute the line of Kaylin Bowman. Uh, Kaylin Bowman, would you please share with the audience uh, your comment about the, the uh, AAFP tool and your experiences with it? I think we're unmuting your line. Kaylin? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? we can hear you. Share with us your experience about the AAFP tool. Yes, um, so I was doing a presentation with students and in researching it and with the, as a co-chair with uh, the Care for Underserved Patients, I found this um, AAFP Neighborhood Navigator, which you can look up by zip code what the resources are. So if you do the tools, if you do the SDOH tools, how do you find the resources once you figure out there's a, an issue? And so when you put the zip code in of your uh, patient, you can then direct them to what is in your local area within the distance of where they live. And I think it's, a, it's an amazing tool and I've used it, especially for transportation, food, where the food banks are, um, even legal issues or healthcare. It's a great tool, I love it. That is fantastic, thanks for sharing that. And for our listeners, that website is navigator.aafp.org and we'll have the staff put that into the chat box so that you have access to that resource as well. Uh, it's navigator.aafp.org. Well, that's wonderful. Well, I also wanna share with uh, all of our listeners that we do have some continuing education opportunities available at pharmacist.com. On uh, related topics, there is a, a CE on unconscious bias that is uh, available to you, as well as um, two uh, CE programs uh, directly related to the social determinants of health, and these are available at pharmacist.com. So I would encourage you, if you'd like to get continuing education and seek more information about it, let's do that through these resources. Now, I wanna take just a moment and do an audience poll and get your opinions and get your insights on something. I'd like to find out on our audience poll, are you personally addressing social determinants of health in your pharmacy practice? In other words, have you made this a matter of some intentional work in your pharmacy practice? Please just click on your screen. Yes, you are, or no, you're not, or not applicable, which means that you may not be directly caring for patients, and that would be understandable for some of you. So give us your response. We'd like to hear who's uh, actively engaged in this work now. And uh, good, we're getting good response. Thanks everybody for being quick on the buttons today. All right, we've got a great response rate. Let's go ahead and close the poll and look at our, uh, our responses. And so uh, that's wonderful. 34% of you are already engaged in personally addressing social determinants in your pharmacy practice. 19% uh, of you haven't gotten there yet. And about almost half of you are in uh, positions where you're not directly involved in patient care. So thank you for responding to that poll. Now I wanna remind everybody, we're gonna open up the lines for lots of questions from our audience. We'll have some additional folks joining us uh, from APHA staff at different times to an answer some of these questions uh, and, so, uh, and to take your comments. Um, we're going to first, we're going to jump off subject just real quickly. We're going to ask uh, Dr. Savitala, Murdy Savitala, to ask a question he has about coronavirus and animals. Uh, Dr. Savitala, we're unmuting your line and you can ask your question. Dr. Savitala, I think you're unmuted on our end. How about you? Can you hear? Oh, I can hear you. How about that? Go ahead. We can uh, hear you. Go ahead and ask your question. I just want to know what the outcome on the uh, animal uh, animals for COVID-19, since a lot of us live with animals these days, and animals don't know the difference between you and them uh, for the for the virus or not so virus. Any stats on those? Great. Well, I, uh, I'll try to take that question for you. You know, the CDC has provided some uh, insights on this subject on their website at cdc.gov. 
Uh, you know, of course, the reason this comes up is because we do believe that the original source for COVID-19 uh, came from an animal, likely a bat, and so that has caused us to ask this question. Uh, at this time, right now, we still do not have enough evidence to tell us that uh, animals of any kind otherwise, domesticated animals, for example, uh, do not have a significant role in spreading the virus. It doesn't mean that they may not uh, contract the virus. Uh, we don't know all of the details of that yet, but at this point, we don't believe, the CDC does not believe that animals have a significant um, uh, role to play in this. Uh, we, we really believe that person-to-person uh, -person contact is the biggest uh, risk factor right now, but there will be more studies done, I'm sure, on this subject, and CDC will uh, keep information on the website about it. It's a great question. We thank you for that. Now, we have a question that was asked uh, uh, by an individual who does not have audio, so I'm going to ask this question. And uh, I'm going to ask Michael Baxter from the APHA staff uh, or Ann Burns to answer this question. Michael, maybe you could uh, uh, join us via video. The question is, how can pharmacies bill for a test administration and then send that uh, to a lab in order to get the results? So this is about billing for uh, COVID-19 testing. Can you give us a little insight into that process briefly? Sure. Um but and it, it depends on how you're going to be reimbursed. So if you're going to be reimbursed, for instance, under Medicare, there are two pathways right now. Um, as an independent pharmacy, for instance, you have to receive a CLIA certificate of waiver. So a certificate basically that you get from your state health department from CMS. So it's through them, you'd apply to your state health department and they'd set that up. And you'd get and you'd bill regularly under that. You'd be paid under the lab fee schedule. It's about $51. Um, it's a bulk payment, so it includes um, everything that you're going to get basically under that payment, but it does not include specimen collection, um, which is something that we're working on. So if you're just doing specimen collection right now as a pharmacist, you may not be being reimbursed right now. So that's something we're still continuing to work on um, currently. If you're going to be paid under a private plan, they typically follow what the government does. So you're probably going to see um, a lot of modeling there right now, so that still may be an issue for the specimen collection issue. Um, if you're under Medicaid, some states, you have to check with your actual your state to see where that's at right now. Um, but as far as sending the results to the lab, when you get that clear certificate of waiver, they'll explain the process for submitting the data. But since you count technically as a laboratory, um, you would be submitting that information under the rules issued bumps from CMS to the patient as well as the results. So you'd issue the results to the patient and also you'd be issuing a lot of data to um, your state health department. So, and there's a lot of um, things that you're gonna be reporting now, particularly now that we're talking about social determinants of health, a lot of factors around race and gender, a lot of those issues that hadn't been being reported will now have to be reported in order to get reimbursed. So that's one option, but it definitely depends on how you're going to get paid um, and who's going to be reimbursing you for that. Great. Uh, thank you, Michael. And I'd just like to point out to our listeners also that at pharmacist.com under the COVID-19 resources, there is a practice resource tool on billing for um, uh, uh, COVID-19 testing, more information about the decisions that CMS has made relative to billing. So I would just uh, encourage everybody to do that. Now we're going to call on uh, one of our audience members, Laura Lakari. Laura Lakari, she has some experience to share with our audience. Uh, Dr. Lakari, would you please join us and share your experiences? She's Hi on. there. Thanks so much for calling on me. I just wanted to say thank you to the presenters so much for your comments on social determinants of health. This has been really important at Roosevelt University here in the Chicagoland area. We have an interprofessional experience where we collaborate with a local medical university. And so our pharmacy students actually are with nurses, MDs, PTs, OTs, PAs. And uh, we have out of six uh, workshops that they work on collaborative, collaboratively. Social determinants are health is one of them. And they follow a patient in the community longitudinally to help them specifically address solutions to their social determinant 
determinants of health challenges. So, uh, President Hogue, thank you for this time. And I just wanted to say to everyone, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. These weekly webinars have been just delightful and much appreciated. Well, thank you for that. We, we're glad you enjoy it and that you find it helpful. Uh, one of our uh, uh, audience members had a comment and a question and doesn't have audio, so I'll follow up. Uh, Pilar, the commenter, said that uh, he loves that you follow up with the patients you haven't heard from in a while. Uh, that is a great proactive approach. What other flags should pharmacists look out for, watch out for that might help them identify that a patient's having issues uh, that might impact their health or management of disease? I mean, we've been so focused on pandemic. Are there other cues that you know of? And uh, Pilar, I'll let you answer first and Leanne, you can also respond to that. I think one of the major ones is if you are working in a community pharmacy, you usually know when your people are, are coming in, especially in a small town where I live. Everybody knows each other. They know you when you walk through the door. And so if you haven't seen someone in a while, if you are having, for us, different churches are having service, some of them are, are calling in, some of them are having service outside. If you haven't seen that person around in the community, um, it's really important that we kind of stay in touch with them. And so I think calling patients, letting them know that you really are concerned is one of the biggest things that we can do. I'm also um, really concerned think about social determinants. That goes into mental health as well. And so just making sure if you haven't seen them, if you haven't heard from them, don't just assume that they don't need help. You should assume that they do and reach out. Wow, that is profound. Uh, when you don't hear from people, don't assume that everything's okay. Assume that everything's not okay and you need to check on people. That What a profound statement. That's great. Leanne, what, uh, do you have anything you'd like to add to this? I think she probably hit the nail on the head there. I think we do have some systems in place that could help us identify um, maybe in some of the larger pharmacies or populations where um, we have adherence tracking and things like that that could help. I do think that this is the importance of that telehealth piece or that extended contact piece where we're or expanded contact where we're really making an effort to keep in touch and to have a system in place by which we're, we're, um, we're keeping in touch and checking in with that patient. Um, and, and then we, we pick up if they're not coming in, if we're checking on their meds and things that are going on. And that's where that telehealth piece comes in again, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it distracts me. There's a question that I have in my mind, uh, Pilar, that I wonder if you could address. Uh, even though it's July, uh, pharmacists are starting to think about flu season already and contemplating the fact that uh, individuals may be reluctant to come into public or to get out and get to pharmacies or the doctor's office to get a flu shot. I guess I personally have a little bit of concern. I have a little bit of worry that people might be hesitant to come and get a flu shot because they don't want to catch COVID. So they don't want to get out in public and catch COVID. Have you thought through at all um, any ideas about how you're going to make flu vaccine easily accessible to your patients this year? Are you doing any special promotional activities for flu vaccine? Any thoughts about that? We haven't started um, promotional yet, but I'm thinking one of the biggest things we can do is to make sure we educate people that you do still need to get your seasonal flu shot. COVID and the flu are two different things and really talk to patients about the fact that you still cannot get the flu from the flu vaccine. And I was also thinking about, you know, we have, we've had some drive-through clinics for getting tested for COVID. You can actually do that with a flu clinic as well. Um, when I was working in the community pharmacy, we had a different um, little door that we could actually go ahead and give that vaccination right while they were there to pick up those medications without them feeling like they were in a big crowd. Um, traditionally, you know how we've done like big flu clinics at, at the health department. I think we're gonna end up having to do away with some of those and maybe schedule those appointments, but definitely just following up with people and letting them know the safety measures that we have in place. But I really could see us doing some drive-through um, flu clinics so people don't even have to get out of their car. 
And you brought up something really important there, Pilar, as we're trying to maintain social distancing. Um, sometimes, you know, having people standing in long lines to get flu vaccine does not necessarily promote social distancing. So right. you really do encourage pharmacies to think carefully through how you're going to provide access to flu vaccine uh, and promote it so that people will actually get the vaccine. Leanne, have your pharmacies that you're working with given any thought to this? Yes, and one thing I would just add there, in addition to some of the ideas that were already um, promoted there, because I completely agree with those, the CDC has a grassroots health marketing campaign in a normal year uh, to eliminate flu vaccination coverage disparities. It's the National Influenza Vaccination Disparities Partnership. Um, and so there's materials that are geared toward promoting flu vaccine, et cetera. And I anticipate that that program will likely have some marketing materials this year that would be um, very helpful, especially in this pandemic environment um, for us to use in trying to get the word out there. Um, so that's a one piece of it is, is how do we promote it and get that educational piece out there. And then the second piece is more to what Pilar um, discussed about how do we then administer the actual vaccine. And the CDC, as you know, with the guidelines for, um, they provide the guidelines for um, practice, pharmacy practice and for vaccine administration, et cetera. So I anticipate um, that there'll be additional guidance coming from, from those and from some of our other organizations like APHA who have uh, toolkits for such things. So. Yeah, th that's that's exactly right. We've got another listener who is uh, wants to alert us to something related to uh, COVID-19 and, and also social determinants. Tim Stratton. Tim Stratton, we're going to unmute your line. We, we I think you've got something very important for us to hear. Tim, I think your line's unmuted. Uh, we're trying to, Tim, I think you're self-muted. Self-muted, just click on the microphone icon, Tim. Okay, well, Tim, uh, we can't seem to get your microphone activated. I'll He's open now. He's open now, Mike. Yeah. Well, you're open now. Tim, go ahead, share your comment with us. Sorry about that, I live by Zoom. I should know better by this point in time. <laughs> um, yeah, just uh, saw some uh, statistics out of uh, CDC within the last uh, couple of days that opioid related deaths are increasing again after we had a, a, a bit of a dip the year before. And so just for the community pharmacists out there, remember if you're working with patients who are receiving chronic opioid therapy, make sure those folks are, are getting access to naloxone. Uh, great point. Yeah, it's uh, again, just reiterates over again that the that the issues that were issues with patient populations prior to COVID are still issues. Even though COVID took center stage for a period of time, we all have to get back to uh, remembering all of the other things that are going on with our patient population. Thanks so much for sharing that uh, insight and experience. Now I'm gonna ask Michael Baxter to join us up. Uh, Kaylin Bowman has a second question that I think is, a, is a, something we want to address. Uh, there's been a change with, uh, with hospital reporting of COVID. Kaylin, we're gonna re-unmute your line and let you ask your question about hospital reporting. Thank you so much. Um, in the recent days, looking at the change of reporting for um, hospitals that we're going to CDC, which where we get our information from and collaboration, it concerns me how this is going to impact the pharmacist's ability to not only give care, but for others, accessing the data and doing our projections. And I'm not sure how we're going to address that as an organization. Michael, do you want to speak to that just a little bit? Um, and just to make sure all of our listeners are on the same page, uh, the federal government announced uh, this last week that hospitals would no longer be reporting their uh, information related to COVID directly to the CDC uh, through the through the network that's been used for reporting of uh, infectious disease for quite a long period of time, but instead would be reporting that directly to HHS. And um, uh, the concern is data um, that researchers, academic researchers and others 
have uh, free access to the CDC databases to be able to perform analytics and, and data analysis, but don't have that, that same access to HHS. So Michael, uh, has APHA been in, engaged in this at all in conversation and, and what are your thoughts on it? Well, I mean, yes, we have been engaged in conversation and we have been monitoring the issue. Um, as, you, as you stated, so now all the data is going to go to HHS. You know, the, the idea and the explanation from the administration has been it's to speed up the time that the data gets to the coronavirus task force for them to make decisions from the top down, um, which is understandable. I think the concern is the politicization of data. So they want to make sure that the data is accurate, that it's all out there, that now we're, we're not getting select portions of that data. So I think that that's the concern right now. So we really need your help on this issue. So we really need to hear, you know, if you start seeing um, a lack of data, if you start losing access to data, um, the CDC is going to be able to access this data. So it's not going to be portioned off from the CDC. They will have access to this data, but they're also headed by political appointees from every administration. So there's a question there about whether or not they'll be controlling that data differently. So if you see gaps, you know, let us know. Um, and we're going to certainly, we'll vocalize and we'll follow up with the departments. We are in communication with them right now. A number of organizations have come out with statements um, issuing their concern about this. Um, and that's something to watch as well too. I think we're all concerned, you know, but we need to know specifically if there's this problems going on and where the gaps are. If there are, you have, have no fear, APHA will address it very promptly. Um, but right now, as they're explaining it, it's to speed up the process to getting it to the coronavirus task force to make decisions. You know, but again, we have those same concerns about access. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Well, I, I think I'll summarize here just to say that uh, pharmacists have a critically important role to play with social determinants. I think uh, Leanne Pilar, you've shared that with us very uh, uh, decisively. I think we all have gained a greater insight uh, because of the information you've shared. One of our listeners today, uh, Randy McDonough, has reminded us also that local county social services and public health departments are a great resource for community pharmacists. Randy has community pharmacy in Iowa City and uh, certainly has that. So I, I, uh, those connections, and I, I think that's good advice for us. Leanne Pilar, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm going to uh, move on now and cover some uh, closing remarks and, uh, and additional thoughts. Um, one thing I want to uh, uh, point out is that uh, there are a number of uh, 15 on 19 educational uh, resources available. Uh, these resources are uh, 15 minute continuing education uh, modules. They're quick listens and they're very informative. In fact, I've completed, I think, almost all of them now. And uh, uh, thanks for that. I needed my CE for the year and that was a good way to get it, little bites, um, but great information. And recently released was a telehealth module, so I hope you'll find that uh, you'll find that useful. Um, also, uh, to let you know that our practice resources are uh, constantly evolving. On the next slide, uh, you'll see that there are quite a number of them, but the, there has been an update made to some of the basics of vaccinations during COVID, and hopefully, you all. Uh, have uh, have had a chance to see these resources. But again, you can click on the link if you download the slides or you can just go to pharmacist.com and click on COVID-19 resources. Now, i like to invite back Michael Baxter and also his colleague, Alicia Carey Micah, who are going to share some information with us about what's going on in advocacy. And there has been a bit going on in the last week or so that you need to know about. So Michael, uh, Alicia, please share with us. Sure, it'll be really quick. Thank you, Michael. Um, hello again, everyone. You know, starting off some very exciting news. Uh, U.S. Supreme Court actually has announced that it will hear arguments on October the 6th on our big case, um, originally scheduled for April, but delayed due to the coronavirus, uh, to uphold the right of the states to regulate pharmaceutical benefit managers or PBMs. Uh, PBMs are arguing that an Arkansas law mandating that the PBMs cannot reimburse pharmacies at less than the drug cost is preempted by federal law. Uh, APHA and pharmacy associations from almost every state disagree and support the state regulation of PBMs and have signed on to a legal brief uh, supporting Arkansas. 
Um, as you likely know, you know, PDMs below cost reimbursements have really left marks on the pharmacy industry, uh, particularly on independent rural pharmacies. Uh, in the last 15 years, 16% of independently owned rural pharmacies have closed. Uh, 630 rural communities went from having one or more to having none. Um, so unregulated PBM business practices that are out to really limit access to pharmacist care and thus the medication <laughs> the public. So we'll, really, we'll keep everybody posted on future updates and the arguments and the outcomes of this important case, but it's really exciting and important because it could really decide the ability of all of the states to regulate you know, unreasonable PBM practices. And can we move on to the next slide? Okay, thank you. Um, and to follow up on this before, Michael mentioned this as well, I believe Tim, who was on before, referenced this. You know, it is important to remember, you know, there are a number of other issues that APHA continues to work on that are also impacted by the public health emergency. Uh, one of those being the ongoing opioid crisis. And as you can see from the slide, and I think Tim referenced these numbers before too, you know, really alarming what's happening uh, for public health officials. But we're already concerned about the impact of the pandemic is having on individuals with depression, isolation, uh, poverty or lack of access to care. You can see, you know, the opioid crisis is really getting worse during the coronavirus pandemic, particularly for minority patients and those in medically underserved areas. The national data showed that, you know, the overall dose deaths have spiked 11% between January and April. Um, according to the CDC data from through November of no, November of 9, 2019, the deaths rose 3% nationally. That's our, and it, as Tim mentioned this too, it's a reversal of the historic drop happened in 2018. You know, and we're really going to get a better picture this week from the CDC, but the early data out today actually shows that there's about 71,000 deaths. You know, that's versus the 67,000 that happened in 2018. You know, so it's ticking back up to where it was in 2017. So we're clearly going in the wrong direction here. Um, but the coronavirus really, you know, it's put a hold on a lot of research, billions of dollars of research for opioid treatment as part of a broader freeze on the non covid work at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, studies on disparities in behavioral health and efforts to deliver medication at their assisted therapies for inmates struggling with opioids were also paused. You know, so it's really vital that HHS renewed the opioid emergency declaration for the 11th time, uh, particularly with this administration because they actually let it lapse by a few days the last time. And it really gives the federal government's flexibility to move around the funds necessary to address the opioid crisis. Um, we do expect, and I think Lisa mentioned this during our last webinar, a uh, similar extension coming out soon for the COVID-19 response, so we'll keep a watch out for that. And just to mention, too, there's some more, more new flexibility that CMS has granted um, in the recent rules that have come out for pharmacist medication management to be offered under Part B, and that's the medical services side of Medicare, and that's when the pharmacists partner up with physicians. Um, and they said they're going, that the opportunity would actually increase access to medication management of individuals, substance and opioid use disorder. And we agree. So we think there's going to be a number of opportunities, hopefully moving forward, to utilize pharmacists on patient care teams, particularly because now the supervision requirement there from the physicians is virtual now. So you can actually do that during the public health emergency using audio or visual devices. So it frees up the pharmacists to do a lot more of these services. I think we've been telehealth earlier as well. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Alicia Carey. Mike, I think she's on the phone, our senior lobbyist, um, who will give an urgent note about our grassroots advocacy to advance provider status. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Um, as we reported a few weeks ago, we've been in constant communication with Congress over the past few months since the pandemic was declared about the important role that pharmacists play in testing for COVID. Uh, congressional action required in order for pharmacists to be recognized as providers in Medicare and thus be paid for the services. So um, related to testing. So we need your help to make this a reality. Uh, Congress returns to DC next week to hammer out details on the next COVID response legislative package. And we have, we expect that this could be the last package that they work on for a while. Um, so on the next slide, um, I just realized we were on this slide here. We um, there is a link, and it is also in the handout. So all you'll have to do is click on the link. We try to make it as easy as possible for you to reach out and contact your members, member of Congress, and your two U.S. senators 
Um, we're asking you to do this today because uh, we they're they're making these packages right now. So please reach out. It's um, it just asks them to include pharmacists in that Medicare Part B as providers, so you guys can start billing for the services that are related to testing. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Mike, I, or anyone on the APA staff. Thank you. And with that, I'll over to Michael Hogue to finish things up. Well, thanks so much, Alicia Carey. I appreciate that. And and pharmacists, let me just urge you that uh, we need you to act on this congressional piece. Even if you've already sent one letter to your congressman, send them another one, remind them uh, it is time. We must act now activate your networks your students everyone and get them to complete those uh, that very simple process that Alicia Carey covered I also want to remind you that the engage platform is available for you to be able to share information with your colleagues and next week we will uh, join you again for another weekly webinar uh, update for pharmacists uh, topics will be uh, evolving this week as we have uh, breaking news and new things happening throughout the week. Uh, I think many of you have uh, realized that uh, these weekly webinars really are helpful for us to be able to get information back and forth uh, and share with each other about what's going on in practice today. So we hope you'll join us next week at the same time and same place. And in the meantime, we thank you for all that you do for your communities, all that you do for the profession, and we encourage you to uh, be a member of APHA if you're not already at pharmacist.com. Thank you for all that you do. Have a great day and God bless.